You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Joanne Fax, Senior Consultant. Our topic is building STEM capacity, and we welcome our guest, Ms. Patricia Woody Reeves, founder and president of PWR Consulting. So, first, Pat, uh, we want to start our interview today by asking you to give us some information on your background. What spurred your interest in engineering, and maybe what was that moment, event, opportunity, time when you knew this is what you wanted to do? and you pursued it and followed your dream. Well, thank you first, uh, Joanne, for that introduction. Um, I would say that my interest really started when I was quite young, probably 10 years old, and I had a science project, biology, about cells, and I was very fascinated with it. There was a lot of research involved. I thought it was really intriguing. And at the same time, I was especially good at math, And I really liked math. I found it very challenging. So when I went on to high school, I did take advanced courses in math, biology, science, uh, chemistry, and physics. And all of those courses um, really led me to to believe that I wanted a career in STEM. I just wasn't sure what career. I really didn't feel like I wanted to be a teacher or do research, which was the only thing I really saw that someone with a science or math degree would do. And my high school uh, teachers really encouraged me to pursue engineering. So uh, it was really building up to that. I saw engineering as a way to have a very fascinating career and to really make a good living uh, with a bachelor's degree in engineering. And so the old adage, um, they say sometimes the glass is half empty and the glass is half full. More and more women are pursuing a career in, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's the half full side. Now, we talk about the half empty side is that a lot of women are trying to reach leadership positions in the STEM-related fields, but the numbers are still quite regrettably small. So you've been advocating and working for increasing the numbers of women in STEM throughout your career, working with the U.S. Naval Surface Warfare Center for quite some time. What worked? What's lacking? What more can we do? Okay, well, I think what's worked is that over the course of, say, the last 35 years that I've been with the Navy, uh, there's definitely the gender bias has lessened. So a lot of young girls and young women, they view STEM differently um, as they've grown up and they've gone on to college. So I think that's been a big change. I think the exposure to STEM at a young age through various science camps, robotics, Girl Scouts, has also made an improvement. And then when I think young women get to college, as long as there are programs in the college that really help the young women recognize that if they do bad in a class or a test that they should still pursue engineering that the you know everyone has a bad grade and so I think those are the things that have started to work Um, what didn't work is that I feel that when the young women get into the workforce uh, even though we had you know even if we had 20 percent women a year it's still a predominantly male field so the overall demographics are really slow to change. And I don't think women oftentimes feel like they're really part of the fabric of the organization. So to change that, I think a lot has to be done in seeing more women in leadership positions, not just hiring them, but looking at how to retain them. Uh, Help your all of your employees understand that this unconscious bias exists. And I saw that a lot in my own workforce that I inherited. It was predominantly male. And I just really try to educate the workforce and understand that this bike exists. So you really need to change the whole overall corporate uh, dynamics to, you know, to help it work. Um, And you have to give women support when they're in the work. 
force. And, you, you know, it has to be more about promotion, seeing women in leadership positions, and all of those things will really help women stay in STEM fields. So what have you particularly done most specifically while you were working with the U.S. Naval Surface Center and now as your own business owner? What are some of the specific things you have done? Because I know this is a, a major interest of yours is to increase the numbers of women in STEM. What have you personally done to try and advance uh, these, these things? Okay, so when I um, was, you know, in the Naval Surface Warfare Center, so for the last 10 years, I was the, the head of the organization. And that really gave me more latitude to do more once I was in a position of leadership. So some of the things I did was I looked very closely at where we did our hiring from. And so many times people will say, well, we went to that college, we tried, we just weren't able to get any women from there. So I really focused on the, um, the individual groups at the colleges, whether they have engineering groups for women or if they're at the Society of Women Engineers. So we, we reached out to the, not just to the university, but to these resource groups that students belong to. And once, you know, I would, I would go myself, I would have other women go. So they would see that, oh, this is an organization that's favorable to women. So that really helped in recruiting women. And then once we had them in the workforce, I established our first women's employee resource group. So women could understand and have an opportunity to, to share their ideas, their concerns about what they saw as challenges in the workplace. That was another very good form. And we did, I did a lot with um, uh, looking at promotion, looking at specifically what job assignments women were getting, uh, when a woman wasn't being promoted, what were the questions that were, were asked, what were the results, and really you know, going through that with a fine tooth comb to see why someone made a decision not to promote a woman. And I found through that kind of leadership at the top, really being invested in the system, you can make some positive changes. I also had a lot of employees involved with programs with our high schools because I felt that was very important to, to start reaching out to the, to the middle schools and the high schools and allowing employees to go there and to support the students in the classroom. So once you do that, you get to a classroom and it's more or less 50% girls, 50% boys. So then students would see that, oh, this is a field that I can excel in. They didn't view it as a, as a predominantly male field. Do you find that uh, younger students still have a propensity to maybe steer away from the science, technology, and math fields? Or do you think now, since 2013, I think we, we came back up to some rate, um, that we're now getting a little better and they're get, you're getting more students involved? Well, I think, um, I think that, one, I do believe that, um, you know, the inner really the intervention or the education, the exposure to STEM has to start at the youngest ages. Because if the students, if they see that, you know, they have an interest in STEM, um, you know, at that point in their life, their, their family, their teachers are the, are the biggest influence. I think one of the problems is that we often talk about uh, people that are in STEM fields are good in math and science. And it's not to say that that fundamentally is going to change. I mean, clearly you need to be good in math and science. However, I think there's too much emphasis to just say, oh, become an engineer, you're good in math and science. I mean, that's, that's just a very boring message, right? I think engineering needs to be presented as something that it's a very create ability to be creative. It's an exciting career. You work in teams, you know, you solve uh, social problems. Um, and I think if the messaging is changed, that will make a difference. The other thing is, I don't think it needs to be presented as a male dominated field. It should be just presented as this is a field engineering. And even though it is male dominated, I think that it's very hard to entice, say, a, a teenage girl or a preteen girl, if you tell them that, oh, this is predominantly a male field, 
girls at that age feel a lot of social pressure. And I think right away, they'll steer away from that. So I think if they are really, they learn from me, they have the exposure at a young age, their confidence is instilled in them that they can succeed in this, um, that they'll stick with it. But I think the, a lot of the messaging has been wrong. So we've talked about maybe being more visible to our, our, our students. Let's talk about corporations headed by women. Let's say if there were more women, more women as leaders such as you <laughs> in their profession, um, what would increase the number of women in, in STEM leadership positions and professions? What would be the effective thing necessary so that people could see more women in leadership roles? Well, I, I do believe that you do need to have more women in leadership. I can tell you that when we were doing our recruiting, many of the young women that we were recruiting told me that they interviewed with us because they saw that a woman could make it to the top. So right there, you know that they see that, okay, you can break a glass ceiling. I think that in the um, in engineering and in, you know, the, in the corporations, they really need to, they talk about it all the time. They need mentors, they need sponsors. A lot of talk about where's your real advocacy. And I'll tell you from my own perspective, even though a lot of people argue that I did quite well, um, I don't think I had the advocacy that I may have had if I was in Washington, DC, because most of the Navy's in Washington and I was more or less isolated in Philadelphia. So I don't think I had a lot of advocacy. But I think that you do need, you know, the corporate culture has to really embrace the fact that women are half the workforce and we can get as more numbers in, in STEM fields of women will make better products, better innovation. So if let's, let's go to advocacy because you just spoke to it. Recently, uh, I was in Columbus at a think tank, which was held to address the question of how best to advance women of color in academic engineering. And most of the participants themselves were women of color who had enjoyed a measure of success. They were chairs, they were deans, that, that type leadership in academia. A consistent theme of the participants was the importance of leaders of academic departments and in colleges and in engineering We've always had supporters and mentors, that, that's been there. But they also said we needed advocates and sponsors to help them advance, to pursue leadership roles, to provide a systematic road to success. Now, is this the type of buddy system? Uh, would it be feasible in the armed services, such as where you were, or do you agree with this? Or do you think um, it would it would help women throughout to advance in engineering. Well, I th I mean I think it would work. I think when you look at the Navy, um, and this is across the board, whether it's on the civilian side or the military side, the enlisted forces in the Navy are very diverse. The officer and senior leadership in the Navy is not so diverse. Um, so because it is male dominated, it's you know, I think you'd really have to educate male officers on why it's important to be an advocate or a sponsor of women. And it really comes down to on a practical level, how do you hold your, you know, holding your managers accountable? Um, where is your priority to hire and to promote these women? So I think that senior leadership really has to be invested in the hiring and the promotion of women in these in these positions of leadership, and if they're not, um, it's not going to happen. There'll just be a lot of a lot of talk, which is a lot of what I saw. That there was a lot of discussion about we need more women, we need to advocate for women. But I didn't really see when you know the rubber met the road that they were really taking an active role in making sure that happened. So I think it can happen, but I don't think it's happened to date to the degree that it needs to happen. Do you think women need to do more to try and promote themselves or do you see any kind of light to see how we could 
better these numbers? Uh, I think that's an interesting point. Um, the, the challenge you have with women doing more to promote themselves is that it comes across as they're being pushy. And uh, when men do that, and they're sort of, it's seen as leadership. And unfortunately with women, you still find that it's viewed negatively. So I think women really, really walk a fine line between being assertive and being accused of being a little too aggressive. But I think it's changing because I think the millennials are changing it. Um, Just that generation. I mean, when I seen the millennials in the workforce, the young men and the young women, they just see each other as equals. And I don't see that, that, um, that look of, oh, why are you here as an engineer? So I think, you know, progress is slow, but I do think it's, it's happening. That's good to hear that they're looking at each other as equals as opposed to, you know, trying, one trying to outmaneuver the other. Um, between 1960 and 2013, the number of women in engineering rose then it fell, and now, most recently, it has come back to only 26%. So, what do you think caused the decline of interest for a while? And what, more importantly, can we do to reach sustained growth so we can get past, and I find this all over, every statistic that you have, it's still for women in leadership positions, it's in the 20-something percentile and we can't seem to get past it so what could we do in engineering to to get advanced growth well one i think that the decline uh primarily occurred because for all the wonderful things that were done to encourage young girls to engage in stem fields right that happened And then, but I don't think the workforce made the adjustments, um, particularly in engineering, to keep women in engineering. Uh, It is a masculine culture. There's no doubt about it. When you take a workforce with 80% men and 20% women, you definitely recognize that there's a masculine culture there. So what needs to change? I mean, the, the, the corporate and culture and team dynamics need to change the new girl has to be given support. I was viewed as the new girl when I started. That's how everybody talked about me, the new girl, right? Not this young woman engineer. People came to see who was the girl that wanted to become an engineer. So all of that, it just doesn't work in 2017. Um, So I think a lot of it is for really, for people to understand the workforce that a lot of men do have an unconscious bias. And it's something that I, I had a seminar with that with my workforce so they would understand that. It isn't a criticism. It isn't to say you're doing something wrong, but it has to be presented as you've primarily worked with men. So it has to change a little. Um, You definitely need more role models. That's key. If you, as long as you consistently have white males as your leadership, a lot of women are going to look at that and say, I don't think that's the career choice for me. And, you know, the promotion opportunities have to be there. They just can't be, oh, well, we, we, we had a diverse pool of candidates, but in the end, we choose the, the obvious solution. And that happens a lot. And, um, and people see that. But I, like I said, I, I do see with the millennials, they, they want more. And they're not going to just, like, not get what they want, um, they're very assertive in a very positive way. To They want their voice. When you tell them you want to hear what they have to say, they have no hesitation in telling you. And I think that's going to make it better. Well, thank you, Pat Woody Reeves. We appreciate sharing this time with you and gaining some insight on the topic building STEM capacity here at Innovators Today. And we wish you the best. I wish you all the success you can have in your new company. And thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.